Hi, Jim here, just dropping in before this week's episode to tell you about my latest movie, The Apocalypse Box. It's a horror film and I'd love for you to check it out. If you go to apocalypsebox.co.uk, you can find all the links on where you can watch the movie. Right, let's get on with this week's episode. Hi, Jim here, and you're listening to the Honest Filmmaker podcast, career advice from people in the business. This week, I'm speaking to costume designer Cynthia Summers. Cynthia is an Emmy award-winning costume designer who's worked on massive shows like HBO's adaptation of The Last of Us and Netflix's Lemony Snicket's A Series of Unfortunate Events. I talked to Cynthia about how she got into the industry. She also told me about the logistics of how a costume designer works within a film set. Uh, She gave me her tips for people wanting to be costume designers on how to get into the industry. And we also, of course, talked about The Last of Us and Lemony Snicket. Enjoy. Where did you train? Did you go on a university course? Sort of how did you start out? Yeah, I started my career out on a completely different trajectory. uh, Costume design was something that kind of um, crossed my path in a way that I wasn't really prepared for, really. Um, I had started out in uh, musical theater and dance and doing costumes for that. Um, I decided at one point to go back to fashion design school to see if I could do anything differently with what I was, um, how I was producing costumes and working and where I was working. And while I was there, there was a film that came to town looking for someone to do, um, build specific tutus for actors for the scene. And so I said, yes. And uh, that's been my motto all along, just say yes. <laughs> and you never know where it's going to lead you. And sometimes great things and sometimes hmm, that's how you discover you don't want to do that. But I was smitten from the moment that I did that. And that, uh, you know, after that, I just basically, uh, I bothered a production designer for about a year. And then he got an indie and um, asked me if I wanted to do it. And I said, yes, <laughs> again. <laughs> I just dove in. I had no idea what I was doing, but that's that's how I started. You're the costume designer. So who do you report into? That would be the art director would it, or the production designer. I mean, I think it's different in different countries and mm. even just in different on different productions. But basically, uh, I work in tandem with the production designer, but separately. Um, all of the other departments work under the production designer, props, set deck, um, greens, all of those departments. We're a little bit of a satellite um, department, and so I uh, I work directly for the director and the producers, and the right. actors. Oh, okay. Of course, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, um, and as a costume designer, and it might be different for everybody, but I'm assuming you're all freelance, are you? You all kind of jump yes. around projects. Yeah, that's what's, right. Yeah, what's that like being a freelancer? I mean, it's great because you're your own boss in some ways until you get the job and then you're, you do have a boss. Um, or it's stressful as all can be, as it, as it can be, because you're always pitching yourself, you're pitching projects. I have a pitch later today. Uh, you know, it's nerve wracking, but that's part of it. That's part of the, the draw and part of the, probably the, the artistic side of it, you know, is always trying to come up with great ideas, be your authentic self, put yourself out there. <laughs> You've got to, I mean, you've got to put all your ego aside when you get to that point because, you know, people are judging you and your work. And that's just, that's part of it. Um, and yeah, so private contractor. Private contractor? But, yeah. <laughs> and does, does your, um, as a costume designer, does your work come from an agent or, or is it from you networking? How's the majority of your jobs come through? It's all of that. It's, I would say that once you get, uh, um, established within your career with, um, within the different communities of film, you sort of, you find the people that you love to work with for one, because that's the greatest way to collaborate is when you're on the same page, um, you have the same sort of creative outlook. Uh, that's the best. So you kind of try to hang on to those directors and producers and production designers. Um, and so a lot of it, yes, does come directly to me, but ultimately goes back to the agent to cut the deals and make sure it can kind of work within um, the schedule that is my life um, and projects that I'm currently in or upcoming or maybe upcoming in the near future. So it's a, big, it's a combo. Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay. And <laughs> talking about that um, pitch meeting where you go in and you chat to somebody if someone finds themselves in that position they've got the opportunity to pitch what would be your advice for them 
it's hard when you go into a pitch because you know that the people you're going to be speaking to who are producers primarily uh, and then hopefully the director have been probably talking about this project for years. So they have preconceived ideas of how they see the characters. Um, when, when I come in, I get to read the script. Uh, I might get to read a treatment. Uh, and then I go away with that. I come up with ideas. I do research. I put together mood boards. I do have someone do illustrations for me. Um, and then I go into my pitch with my best guess and at what they want and also what I can bring to, to the table. And I think that's really important because as my agent said to me yesterday, <laughs> um, you know, this may not be the project. You're not, you, you may not get this project, but go in with your best ideas because you may come up with something that they hadn't thought about that they may go, oh yeah, brilliant. That's actually a great idea, which will just elevate you closer to the project. Again, you may not get it because there's a lot of us, you know, vying for the same projects, but producers and directors, whoever's in that meeting may remember you down the road, or if it's a series, for instance, they may remember you in for the next season, or if the costume designer they're thinking of is only doing the pilot, then, you know, they may remember you for the rest of the season. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. If, I don't think we have to be on this egotistical platform where they didn't pick me for the pilot, so I'm just not going to do it. I mean, mm. that may be something you may think about, but as far as I'm concerned, there's always reasons um, that a lot of times are out of your control that you may not get this project, but you may get its successive season, or you may work for these producers down the road. So you just need to put yourself out there. It's like an artist. The more people see your work, the more they begin to understand you and, and see you and see you're there, that you're there and then will think of you in the future. And yeah. Do you ever go into those meetings and come out and think, oh, I don't want to do that? Do you ever, does that ever happen or yes. are you only ever in meetings? It does. All right. Okay. Uh, yes. <laughs> Yes. And again, it's for a lot of reasons. Um, I've gone into uh, meetings and I have met producers uh, who are, you know, you always meet the creative producer. So the person who's either written the script and is the creative producer working on the project um, or a combo. There's usually at least four people you're speaking to, maybe more sometimes. Um, and I've gone in and loved, loved the people I'm speaking to loved their ideas, like really excited for their project. And um, and then when it gets down to doing the deal or understanding when you're speaking with the producers that are local to where you're going to be working, how, you know, mechanically we're going to be doing this, if you will, or how, how on the day to day we're, and I was just like, oh, I don't think I'm up for that. That sounds like someone with way more energy than me, or it just sounds like, a little bit of a little bit of a nightmare if you will and i just mm. you know it's not a bad thing to back away at that point because it, it's worse if you get into it and you never want to leave a project never mm. so um it's better to make those kind of judgments if you can ahead of time yeah good advice yeah. good advice yeah. <laughs> and um so looking at looking at your imdb which is packed full of and i looked at you've even got on imdb you've got like a sizzle reel of all your stuff and yeah. and it all i know you've probably chosen stuff that's perfect for costume but it all looks like our dream jobs for costume designers <laughs> um so starting with uh, a series of unfortunate events which has got yes. a ton of amazing costumes in it tell yeah. me a bit about that project yeah i mean definitely a series of unfortunate events and working with Baron so Barry Sonnenfeld was a highlight for me. And um, it's, you know, it's like when you're, it's, it's like a musician and you put an album out or a CD or whatever they call them these days. And then, you know, you, you're not, and it's a smash hit and the next one's got to be even bigger. I definitely have felt that. I am not even sure, maybe with The Last of Us, completely different genre, but maybe with The Last of Us and maybe some other projects. I'm not sure I've actually done better than that. <laughs> For me, it was like, it was a great experience all around. I was working with incredible creatives on every level in every other department. Um, we were working rapid fire. We built absolutely everything. We uh, did two seasons of amazing costumes. And I just was really, really lucky to be working with producers who had a clear 
or even if there was a question, uh, you know, it was a, a really collaborative event um, and a, a network that was incredibly supportive. So um, just, yeah, that was a dream job for sure. I keep waiting for the next Lemony Snicket to come my way. And <laughs> I haven't had it in that. It's a real unique genre that it falls within as mm -hmm. well. So it's not anything really specific. It's not period. It's, it's not co completely fantasy. It's not sci-fi, which is fantasy sci-fi is the category that uh, the guilds um, or the awards events will put you into, put it into, but I, I've never really felt in mm -hmm. completely in that genre for me. It's, it's unique. I loved it. It is. Yeah, it is. It's and unique. the costumes, yeah. so some of those sequences, just because merely because <laughs> of what's happening on the screen, so theatrical, big, and very. Went, I could tell you went to town on it. Yes, um, yes. So talking about uh, The Last of Us, in, in my mind, I'm probably wrong, but if I'd gone, and I know you didn't jump from that project to that project, <clears throat> but getting The Last of Us, huge program, low, everyone's anticipating it, wanting to see it. Mm. Isn't there a little bit of you that goes, oh, it's going to be all dark and... Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. <laughs> Is there a part of you? Absolutely. And when my, again, when the producer who I worked with several times, Rose Lamb, she brought me to the project and I said yes. And then I asked, because you always say yes at first. And then I asked my agent again, do I, do I want to do this? It's like, a, it's post, not really post-apocalyptic, kind of. It's not, it's not like altered carbon futuristic in the same way. It's, it's like, it's jeans and t-shirts in the biggest sense, you know, do I really want to do this? And it's based on a game. I don't know. Do I want to do this? And my agent reminded me, you said Cynthia, the same thing about, um, about another project you worked on. That was the same thing, uh, but I think you should take a look at it and look at some of the information that's out there in the world for, for it and the story, et cetera, et cetera. And then speak to these people. And I did. And again, I spoke to Craig Mason and, gang and um he presented it to me that it's a love story and i was like a love how is this a love story i don't understand that it's a love story to humanity and i was like okay well that's and then i watched more and i watched you know some clips on the clickers and when you understand the demise of a human being who's infected uh by these um mushroom spores um, and, and how they become completely uh, the out, it's out of their hands, how the rest of it turns out for them and how they become victims. But it's actually nature. It's nature. This phenomenon actually exists in nature right now within insects um, and, you know, just not in humans yet because our body core body temperature is too high. But when you think about all that and you put it together and then I watched a clip of the <laughs> clicker that uh, because they work on echo sounding and got stuck in a corner. And I just remember feeling so much sympathy for this creature. And anyways, that kind of got me. And then the clickers were something amazing to build as well. So they were, they were amazing costumes, worked super closely with uh, makeup effects, Barry Gower in London, just ama an amazing production with props and makeup effects and the sets and the actors and the movement actors. It was just really wonderful. So actually going back, I kind of got ahead of myself there, but going back, I think you have to look at the project and go, what is in this for me as a costume designer? How does this pertain to me and my creative team? And um, I I'm so glad I did it. I mm. mean, what if I said no? Bonk! You know, yeah. I would really have regretted it. It was another move leap forward in my career in a way that I wasn't expecting, um, meeting a great bunch of people that I'd never worked with before on a so, such a large production, production, such grand world building. The sets were amazing. Just being a part of the product that, um, that was put out at the end is something I'm extremely proud of for myself and my team. Uh, so I think you have to look at the larger picture when you're looking at a project like that, that at the, uh, for face value just looks like jeans and t-shirts, but you know, getting Pedro out there in his jeans and t-shirts look was not an easy task. Uh, we also did it during COVID or just post COVID. So there was all of that, that the, the world was basically shut down 
the clothing mills, the, 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 everything was, you know, just trying to get going again. There was no product out there. Again, we wound up building a lot. So um, I think you just have to look at the overall and, and pick out what might be in it for you and your team. And nobody on my team regretted doing it. Nobody. So yeah. 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 Good show. Very good show. Yeah. Um, And talking of your team, do you tend to take the same people with you or does the production ever say, right, here's your team and you're in charge? Yeah, I wherever I can, I take them with me. And I am uh, originally from Vancouver, Canada. So my team that I've built up over the last 30 years, uh, a lot of them have stayed with me or, you know, if we've gone off and done things without each other, we tend to always come back, which is so wonderful because you know, you have a shorthand then and just makes your life easier. And I think it makes the creativity more fluid as well. Um, But the sad part is if I fly off to Budapest or London or somewhere else to do a show, I've never worked in London, would love to. um, Those are the times where production wants to hire local, which um, yes, is totally understandable on all the levels. You've got to have the people working. Um, A lot of those times, I have, I may be lucky enough to bring my assistant designer with me one person. Uh, when I did The Last of Us, we were working in Alberta, Canada, and I got to bring 14 of my crew with me, which were all my department heads within my department. Um, but out of the 60 people that worked with us full time on that crew, that's not in count, you know, counting all the you know, day calls and people we had coming in, um, all, or all the outside artisans that helped us create these costumes, only 14 came with me. But a lot of the times I can only bring one person if I'm working mm. away and then need to hire local, which, um, is, is, is a great thing as well, because, you know, as I'm new to wherever I'm working, I rely on the people that are local to know where to go, uh, for all the products we need to create, you know, all the costumes and the looks for after and, um, so yeah, it's kind of yeah. works both ways. Works both ways. So mm. if I'm uh, uh, want to get into a costume on a movie mm. and I want to mm. get on your team, how yes. do I do it? What do I need to do? <laughs> you come to Comic Con. <laughs> so I was recently <laughs> at Comic Con in San Diego, and I had one lovely, uh, lovely um, woman who has we've been followers on Instagram. We're friends on Instagram, I guess. And she came to Comic-Con and I was shocked and surprised. There's a couple of other cosplayers who, who I've been following for a long time and have come, but she specifically wants to work on my team. She's from Mexico, lives Mm. in Mexico. Um, Hi, if you ever watch this. Uh, Mm -hmm. uh, And you know, when, when it happens, I would definitely reach out to her and say, you know, I'm going to be at this location. If you can come on up, let's do this together. I also have a lot of people who reach out globally to me. Um, I just have a young, had a young lady from uh, Paris who wants to come and um, do one of her uh, it, um, projects that she's doing for her curriculum uh, for mm-hmm. a program that she's in, in in France. And she wants to come and do a two week um shadow program with me unfortunately i won't be working when she's doing that but those are other ways Mm -hmm. um definitely you know social media makes it much easier than when i was starting out where there was just a telephone uh and or the post (laughs) uh or eventually there was pagers so you know now it's much much easier and i am so open uh to people reaching out via instagram or or facebook or how whatever platform you happen to be on um and you know if i can i will reach out to you i think that's a great way to do it um definitely have something to show a lot of people have portfolios or sizzle reels or um their resumes online that's great that's a great way to sort of get yourself out to just about anybody and i have in the past been able to sort of steer people on to other designers um when i know that probably they'd be better served there um, or I'm not in that country or and won't be for the foreseeable future. So here's someone you could reach out to, whether that person reaches out back to you or not is, you know, obviously not up to me, but um, I only will port, you know, forward people on to people that I, I think are pretty open to being hopefully not inundated, but you know, people who genuinely 
do want to work in the field will reach out. Um, and otherwise, you know, um, in North America specifically, we're all unionized, most of us. Um, reach out to the unions, reach out to the guild associations, reach out to, um, I don't know, local theaters. I have a lot of students who reach out, whether they're in high school or in a university project. So I, I think that generation is much more bold, which I think is amazing. You know, back in the day, I'd be like, oh, I don't know if I should or not. But you must be bold. You must be because there's just too many people. And the industry is changing, has changed since COVID, since the strikes, uh, since the networks and the studios are all recalibrating, uh, since AI, AI has become an issue mm -hmm. <laughs> in the industry. I don't think it's our friend. That's my take on it. Oh, really? Um, yeah. I don't think so. And I think it needs to, it's going to need to go through a lot of iterations before it comes to um, the film industry and the television industry in a form where it will be actually productive for us as opposed mm. to a threat. Mm. So I foresee that's years. I'm, I'm not really, you know, very technical, technologically advanced in that world, but it seems like the talk and the, talk on the street, it's going to be years before we find a, a way where it can become a useful, useful part of our industry without our industry. Um, I mean, you, you know, when you're watching AI, mm. you know, when it's an oh, AI yeah. character yeah. and I mean, film at its, at its core is a, is a, is an art form. Mm. And when you watch AI, it's super disappointing. And the fallout from that as well is, and then I won't go too much into this because I could go on forever, is it eventually would take all our jobs. If there mm -hmm. is, if, if, if AI can just create, if, if it can buy my image and create my costumes, well, there's no need for a costume designer, which means mm -hmm. there's no need for my team. There's no need for a props master. There's no need for a production designer to create the sets we're in or to set, you know, create the scene, scenic, uh, you know, world that we're living in. It's really, uh, it's frightening, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it is, it's difficult because like you say, at the moment you can tell when it's AI, mm -hmm. but soon you won't be able to. That's right. And then, you know, films should come with a warning. This has been created by AI, that's so we the, know. That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. And we do use CG and we do use a lot of special effects already. It's not mm -hmm. the same thing though, because you have to shoot plates. You have to shoot you know, something that you can put your characters and your actors into. It's, it's a different process altogether. It still requires people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it still yeah. requires human beings and artists that know their craft uh, to be able to create, you know, color tones. And I, I mean, yeah, I, yeah. I could go on. It's I don't know a, if yeah. that's this podcast. So <laughs> No, it's, it does come up often because it is, obviously I'm talking to creative people. Yeah. And you know, you've only got to think. So I was looking at some of the stills from some of the shows you did. I think it might have been a unfortunate events. There's a lady and she wears like an octopus. Yes, costume. Esme. Yeah. 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 Yeah, Esme. yeah. So so that, for example, I bet if I put into AI, create me a theatrical octopus costume, that image would be because it's so prolific, would be yeah. a reference point. So your yes. your creativity is being stolen and used. That's right. You know, to it's create something else. So, yeah. 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 So it's not good. Um, Definitely. So, so let me concentrate on something positive. Yes. Um, <laughs> what I was going to ask you was, looking back on everything you've done, yes, is there an actor or a character that you've been like super duper excited to design for? Definitely. Um, let's talk about Esme. Esme mm. Squalor on a series of unfortunate events, who came in around season two or on season two, and. Uh, she, uh, Barry Sonnenfeld just really wanted her to be larger than life. And then, of course, we had Lucy Punched, love Lucy, who who is a, a character actor when she really gets into her body can bend in like ways I've never seen. And she's like tall and lean and she's got these extraordinary long fingers and we always have these long. So everything's over accentuated on her to begin with. And she embraced every single one of I want to say, OK, if I want to, uh, 15 books, uh, probably somewhere in the neighborhood of at least 25 specific looks over the season two and season three. And she, um, she just embraced every single one. She never said no to anything I put out there. <clears throat> 
and um, her 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 costumes were very specific and and location specific. For instance, the octopus costume, or if we were at uh, the in the carnival uh, episode, very specific. Even just driving from Mount Frott. Uh, in in that episode to the carnival, she had a travel outfit on. She had her beret on, and she always and then she had like the sheriff star on her on her beret, like taken from um, as a nod to where she's going. Because we were going to the vile village, and the vile village was uh, about a sheriff and uh, about crows and a little bit of the old west. And uh, her, she just was always giving us. Uh, little little Easter eggs of where we were going, where we came from. She dressed for the occasion, and she even says in a lot of her dialogue, "It's fashion." You know, she's very fashionable, and she was very in, always in, and she was always the, you know, per the the character that was telling us what was in and what was out, and and I just I loved her. It was the best because I got to go, also within our story, Count Olaf all always dressed up for. Um, she dressed for the occasion. He dressed for character when he, his mm -hmm. disguise and his character was on a definitely downhill slide and she was on an uphill slide. So you can kind of see that within their costume arcs. I just loved her. I loved everything. Both of those actors, both of those characters were amazing, amazing to work, to, to create. Yeah. yeah. And I had carte blanche. It was like, go big or go home. Like just go Go, oh, go, really? go big. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Barry was like, make it big. Just make sure you know what set she's working in so she doesn't blend with the set, which was always a thing on that show because the sets were just outstanding. Just outstanding. Mm. Yeah. So, so again, looking back, what do you wish you'd known when you started? Well, I, I technically, I wished I had known um, about more about um, the mechanics of the day-to-day -day of filmmaking because I did not go to film school. I went to fashion school. So I didn't know how to read a call sheet. So my, my, my one and only person that was a part of my crew on the first film I ever did, Double Happiness, which was a large, large indie, uh, the, the, our first day, he and I were looking at this, this call sheet going, and if you know what a call sheet is, it's, it's basically the Bible for every shooting day of who's coming in, what time they're coming in, what scene they're playing, what time they're out, uh, if this is their last day of work, all these little acronyms on it. And uh, we had no idea what they were. We'd be like, SWF, SWF, what is, I don't know what that means. Anyways, we figured it all out. I wish I had known that, that would have helped me out. Um, looking back now, I don't know. I can't say because I definitely feel like um, I learned on the job hmm. um, because I did not go to film school. So I learned on the job. It's been a bit of a blur um, because of that. But also what I have learned as I've gone along is I never stop learning. And I've been doing it 30 years. And part of that is because I didn't know everything when I began. Nobody does. Um, the industry has changed. The technology within the industry has changed, you know, from film to to um, what, what we use on television, what we use then, what we use now, uh, where it's going to be going. You're never not learning as you go. Um, filmmaking has also become very, uh, with the use of the internet uh, and what we're doing right now, for instance, um, I do a lot via Zoom. I do, I even do costume fittings during, via Zoom, not so much oh, really? anymore, but yeah. during COVID or after COVID, you know, when we all couldn't be in the room together, um, you know, I'd be, my assistant posted this one photo of us and she's holding my laptop towards me like this. And I am talking to the director who had to go back home to England actually, because he got COVID while we were shooting. Oh, and um, I'm showing him like fabric and I'm going, showing him how it's moving and how it's going to move in the wind via a Zoom call. So that hasn't really gone away because I think that people have realized the value of Zoom and being able to um, be in different places and be more effective and efficient uh, with time management. Mm -hmm. So that's not perfect because you're not able to, you can't touch things and you only see things in a certain light and they change in different lights and blah, 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 blah. But that's... Um, that's all, you know, that's become a big real, a, a big working tool has been mm. uh, Zoom and um, just sending things. I still send things um, via um, um, emails. 
Mm. So here's some looks. You can zoom in on things. It's, mm. it's, it's become a big, I don't get to set as often. And I've actually, I've actually asked off my uh, other costume designers. I know I'm like, especially when we're doing series, how often do you get to set these days? Because uh, so much of what we do is, is now virtual. A lot of times locations like today we're shooting an hour and a half away from where the studio is. So by the time you get there, you know, as you know, I had problems getting to the studio this morning. <laughs> uh, I, by the time you get there, you've lost so much time. You don't, mm. Then you're on set for maybe an hour because what I do is usually in prep and not on set. Then we got to get back. So I probably won't go to that location. Mm. And it's just kind of a fact of life, unfortunately, these days with film maybe. But again, learning as I go picking the moments when I can be on set and thank be, thankfully set is very connected with us in, in prep here um, with all the virtual tools we have. So I can make comments and changes like in the moment still mm -hmm. on set without even being there. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to ask you a couple of fun questions now. Uh -oh. final fun questions These ones always are. stump me. These ones <laughs> always stump me because there's so many possible yeah, it's answers a, it's a tough one because <laughs> i spoke to a production designer the other day and i was like what's the best the most beautiful film and i think he and he said afterwards he was like oh, i was struggling with that because you don't want to say something obvious you don't want to yeah. say something you don't want to forget something really good yeah but, you know good luck yeah um, thanks <laughs> so i was just going to ask you so this is a big one uh -oh. is what's your favorite costume in a tv show or a film you've ever seen well, it's interesting you say that, uh, or, or it's, inter it's interesting we talked about Lemony Snicket because I often try to answer these questions with not my own work because it mm. seems very egotistical. But I thought this morning with, you know, my delay in getting on here and just, I thought, you know, Cynthia, just go with what comes to you because my answer might be different tomorrow anyways. So I'm going to go with Esme's octopus costume <laughs> on a series of unfortunate events because that was really the what I was given on that was from Barry is it needs to be purple and a specific color of grape he was mm. very specific with colors on that show very specific um, and it needs to look like it could be animated and in the perfect world maybe if Barry had done this in the future when we have AI maybe that he would have gotten more what he wanted but um but we aren't animating it because we shot Lemony Snicket like a stage production. So if you can't make it work as you would on a stage, it really wasn't done. Uh, so I had to make it look like the tentacles actually moved without being automated. So mm. that involved a lot of ingenuity, air, an air pump, <laughs> um, some stuff, some on wire, and actually Lucy's movement. So we quarter choreographed it with her movement so she could get some of the you know the tentacles moving in a specific direction i had to have the latex dyed in london because that is where i could find uh the people who could do it the best and get the specific mm. color of purple that we needed um and just the day-to-day -day of that and that actually that uh costume actually traveled to museums for museum exhibits and had to be reconstructed because each of the tentacles is put on separately. They each come off mm. separately because we had to be able to re <laughs> blow them up as nice. it were, because they didn't, they didn't stay blown up as air doesn't um, and balloons don't. So um, that probably for me, Lemony Snicket has been a real big part of conversation mm. for me in the last couple of weeks, which is interesting. Maybe it's yeah. coming back. Wouldn't that be great? Maybe let's hope so. <laughs> um, it's nice, you know, just having kids, it's nice to have something we can all watch together. You don't, there's, you'd be amazed. Well, I don't think you would, but the amount yeah. of times we could put anything on and we're just like, yeah. no, that's not suitable. Yeah. This is not, this is too kiddie. This is, you know, mine are like 13 and 15. Yeah. And just being able to find something fun that you can watch together is, is a challenge. I, it is um, a challenge. I think Lemony is, um, if I can, is genius for that because the writing from the books to the scripts is genius and as an adult you get a lot of the references that i think mm. a, a child won't even a 14 year old won't a lot of um a lot of uh um you know um written uh, uh, there's just so many references that we get as adults so it, yes it's great for all, all generations and i think what's also great is i have grandchildren who mm. um have been watching it since they were little 
uh, but uh, now are starting to get some of the nuances and the references and the, uh, that they wouldn't under have understood when they were younger, which is great. I think that's a perfect, mm -hmm. it's timeless yeah, in that respect. Definitely, yeah, definitely. Um, so the other one was, um, if you could reboot or remake any film or franchise and do the costumes on it, what would it be? Yeah, and weirdly, what came up for me also in my car driving here today was the birds, Hitchcock's The Birds. And maybe because it was black and white, maybe, I, I don't know. And I thought about that and I thought, well, what, Cynthia, that's maybe, is, is that, are you like digging a hole for yourself on that one? Because it was done, it was perfect. Like, why mm -hmm. would you redo it? It's such, a, again, a specific genre. It's done with the Hitchcockian eye. Like, how would you redo this? And I actually don't know, but I would mm -hmm. love to try. And we're talking <laughs> color. Would you do it in color? Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. And you know when you see film that have, uh, they have a patina, but it's not specifically color and it's not actually black and white. Mm. Maybe it would be that. Mm. You know, so, so we still have the essence of black and white, but it's got that real, it's like, it's like vintage uh, photographs that are, are, are painted, well, hand painted, yeah, watercolors, painted, yeah. and then fainted, faded over time. Maybe that mm. aspect. Maybe bring yeah. that aspect to it. That sounds good. It's funny, isn't it? Because um, I don't know if there's some legal reason, but not a lot of Hitchcock films have been remade, have they? And you yes, would they, think there's a big well there, isn't there? That's, that yeah, oh, think. totally. And, you know, yeah. it must, yeah, it must be the estate. I don't know. Yeah, must be the estate. Yeah. Okay, uh, last question for you. And you've already told me this, but I want you to expand a little bit on it. Is uh -huh. What is your motto? Oh, first of all, just say yes. Because sometimes when you're saying yes, you're just listening to the pitch. And mm. you may be able to just say right away after you've spoken to someone about the project, um, you know, that maybe it's not for you. Uh, early on, and early on, up in, and even up until, even now, because the, as I mentioned before, things are changing, the industry is changing. I say yes to most things. There's only things that I say no to, which are like hardcore horror, like oh, really? chainsaw, <laughs> chainsaw Massacre, like anything where someone in real life could actually maybe recreate that. I mm. just... I, I, I do do some horror films and I do lots of stuff with blood all the time and lots mm. of stuff with detached body parts, but like the, the psychological horror is really hard for me to do. I've mm -hmm. had to say no. I actually started one once with, with a friend and I had to say, listen, I just, the way this is growing and becoming, I just, I, I can't do it. I, I just can't, like, I can't, I can't come to work every day and do this. I can't do it. But here's someone I think would be fabulous at it. Or here's my ACD who's willing to carry on with it. And, you know, fortunately we found someone to carry on. So that was great. But um, that's the only genre that really is hard for me, like really mm -hmm. hardcore horror. Um, mm -hmm. But otherwise, be interested, be, uh, be, be willing to talk to people. Um, if you're starting out in the industry, um, just like starting out, starting out, not talking as a costume designer, but just someone who wants to work in film, in costume, um, be willing to do just about anything within that department. Uh, I had uh, a, a person on um, Lemony, or sorry, Last of Us, who mm. actually worked in accounting, but was a super fan of the game. And where we were lo uh, locally shooting it, <clears throat> We just couldn't get enough crew. We couldn't get enough crew. And I said to them, if you're willing to come in at this level, X level, which is basically the, you know, the, the, the ground floor level where yeah. you're basically doing anything that anybody needs in the day on the moment, if you're willing to do that to learn quickly, I think that this may work for you because I got to know them and just through, because I was working with them via the accounting department, and I, I knew that they were, that they had it. They had the grit for film. They had, they had it. And so they said yes. Uh, and they turned out to be one of my favorite people working. And they climbed up within our department on that show. And, you know, not to the top or anything, but they really moved up. And mm. it was a great credit for them. And they were able to move on. And I have not worked with them since, but geographically, we're just not in the same place. But I think that you really need to be able to um, try. And you may find out the costumes is not for you, mm -hmm. just as they found out accounting was not for them in <laughs> film, you know, or on that project in any case. So you really need to put yourself out there. You need to search 
the people, search all the different avenues, um, be available when the call comes. I actually lost out on a job while I was doing The Last of Us, and I had pursued a costume designer who kind of heads up, um, oversees all of the their shows. So she, they, she kind of works as an, an executive producer, and I had done um, I had done a uh, a panel with her, and I had said, listen, if you ever are looking for designers, I know I. I'm not new and a lot of times she'll bring people up, which is great, but I would, I love your company. I love your EP. I love everything you do. Please think of me. And about a year and a half went by and she called me and I was on the last of us. And I said, no, is this that call? And she said, yes, it is. There's something, I think you're perfect for it. It's going to be a blah, blah. I'm going to be, and I couldn't take it because mm. I was on The Last of Us and I couldn't, yeah. I wouldn't be finished on time. But there you go. There, you know, it didn't work out that time. I still haven't worked with them. I still would. Uh, mm. But you just have to keep putting yourself out. You have to say yes. Don't put yourself in a situation that may be bad for you, but you need to say yes to, to try and figure it out. I think mm. that's, I think that's across the board on anyone who's trying to get established. Reach out. Don't be afraid to reach out. Social media makes it so easy these days. So it's not like you have to show up on someone's doorstep with some baked goods anymore <laughs> you, and your portfolio. Although that's yeah. also not a bad way to go. But also when you get the call, can you come in tomorrow? If, if you can, if you can cancel whatever you can cancel to show up, that's how you get your foot in the door. I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you'd like to hear from more industry professionals, how they got into the business and how you can do the same, or you just want to listen to some cool stories from movie sets around the world, then please do subscribe to the Honest Filmmaker podcast. Mm -hmm.